I'm reading in, in a couple of portions of scripture. If you'd like to turn there with me, Second Samuel, uh, chapter thirteen, I think it is. And I'm going to paraphrase because I've got a, a long way to go, and it's Sunday, and I'm the only thing between you and feeding your face. So I'm I'm going to do my best to just get in and out of shoot as fast as I can. I'm I'm just going to go down here, uh, verse thirty-seven. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amahud, king of Gezer. And David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled and went to Gezer, was there for three years. Continue. And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. So, and I... And just one more verse. Next chapter. Now Joab, the son of Zariah, perceived that the king's heart was towards Absalom. That's all I want. Okay? So as you're turning to one more portion of Scripture, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Just so you understand. So I paraphrase all this. What's happened is Amnon's a dirtbag. And he's Absalom's brother. And, and Amnon... Had a friend. Remember when I told you last night? Be careful who your friends are. He had a friend named Jonadab who was a dirtbag. And he convinced him because he wanted to have sexual relations with his, his sister, Tamar. And, and so Jonadab put this little scheme into his head. Well, the story says that he forced her and literally he raped her. Okay? And King David didn't do beans about it. Nothing. He didn't do nothing. Well... Now Absalom has waited all these years to get even. So that story that I read there in, in 2 Samuel, he, he gets the guys, he said, now when I tell you, let's go kill this slob. So they turn around and they say, okay. And the, all the king's sons killed him and they took off running. Well, Absalom is afraid of judgment. So he runs away and goes to another land. So you got the picture. He, he killed this guy because he had raped his sister. Okay, you understand? The word is yes. Okay. I thought maybe you were just from another country or something. The word is yes. Okay, so he's run away. But I want you to get what it says. But David longed to go to his son. And then in 14 to 1 it says, And Joab perceived, you got to get this, that the king's heart was towards Absalom. Okay? Now, now, now let me just go to Matthew chapter 12. I know you're standing long, but uh, it, it'll be worth it. I know me. I'm going to be good, okay? <laughs> I'm going to be good. Now I'm reading in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 10. And there was a man which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? Now you would think it would say, they might applaud him. They might praise him. They might honor him. They said, oh, no, uh, we're going to accuse you if you do something good because we're really stupid. You didn't get it yet. You're missing these good times for amens. Said, said, they turn around. They watch to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath. Now, they couldn't heal a headache on a dead frog. They can't do beans. But they're mad at anybody that can do something. So, so you just get this picture here. I'm going as fast as I can, but I'm just, whew, I'm excited. So he said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? He said unto them, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? If it fall into a pit on a Sabbath day, he will not lay hold on it and lift it out. How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, stretch forth thine hand. He stretched it forth. It was restored like as the other. Then the Pharisees went, and held, went out and held counsel how they might destroy him. For healing somebody. For delivering somebody. For helping somebody. When you read the rest of it, he says, but when he knew it, he withdrew himself from thence and a great multitude followed and he healed them all. Now, what part of all are you struggling with? Is that too much of a theological term? All? Do you know what the Hebrew word for all is? All. You know what the Greek word for all is? All. 
You know what the Brooklyn, New York word for all is? All. Okay, now I'm fixing to give you a smoker, buddy. Just buckle your seatbelts. There's going to be a little turbulence. Yuck, yuck, yuck. I want to preach to you on this subject. God has got an attitude about you. No, you missed a good chance to just say amen. See, you, you missed it. You're, I'm going to have to signal you a little bit better. God has got an attitude about you. And it's a good one. Woo! It's a good one. Lord, bless the teaching and the preaching. Help me to be a blessing. Loose the captives, set people free, restore people, reconcile people, convince people. Lord, let the power of God be released in the house in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hate quiet. And, I'm, and I think God's got an attitude about it because he said when we get to heaven, there's only going to be 30 minutes of silence. That's for all you folks that like it quiet. <laughs> Once that's over, watch out. The noise train is on its way. Yes. Now, I, 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 I got to get you because uh, you're looking at me like I'm, I'm a drug addict or something. You, you, you stay with me just for a second. God has got an attitude. Right. Now, I am grateful and thankful to the many attributes that God has. He's all wise. He's all knowing. He's all powerful. He's long suffering. He's patient. He's good. He's gracious. He's kind. He's faithful. I thank God for all those attributes. But when the Lord began to deal with me about this thing, it just fried my little brain. He said, Tell my people I got an attitude. Now, I hear a lot today about people when, you, when you're not acting good and you're not doing good, they'll say, You got an attitude. You need, to, you need to change your attitude. You, you got an attitude. Let, let, me, let me just tell you what the dictionary said. Attitude. How one feels or sees things or people. A mental outlook. An inner disposition. An inner opinion about something or someone. A direct revelation of how one feels, which determines how one acts. Attitude. Now, I'm going to make a statement. And uh, they ought to have me tell this to general conference, but I'm not welcome because they'd help the whole movement. You ready? Here it is. This is so powerful. Oh, God. I'm in love with my own notes. <laughs> let, 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 let me try it again. This is a true story. True story. A professor from a university who was the leader of a bioethics class presented a scenario to his students. And here's what he said. There was a couple that were fixing to have children. The father had syphilis. The mother suffered with TB. Her first child was born blind. The second child died at birth. The third child was born deaf. It's a true story. The fourth child suffered from TB. The lady is pregnant once again. But this time, they have come to you as a counselor asking your counsel because of all the terrible stuff that's happened in the last four pregnancies. They're asking your advice, and whatever you say, they will comply with it. If you think it would be wise and smarter to abort the baby instead of coming up with another deaf baby or tuberculosis baby or, or an impaired child, Tell us what you should do. Now, this is a true story. And the whole class debated it. And when they finished, every person in the class came up with the same conclusion. They said, looking at the past and what has happened and the fact that you've got diseased bodies, it would be best if you aborted the baby. To which the professor said, congratulations, you just killed Beethoven. You didn't get it yet. Don't you get it? We like Beethoven. Every one of us are pregnant with some music. Every one of us are pregnant with some praise. Every one of us can contribute to the life that we live and the church that we're a part of. 
So now here comes my statement, Doc. This is the most mind-boggling thing I've ever had in my life. Tell my people, I will never consult your past to determine your future. I don't, woo. I don't care how many times you backslid. I don't care how many times you were hurt. I don't care how many times you made a mess. I don't care how many times you've had affairs. It doesn't matter. God is so great. He will never consult your yesterday to determine your tomorrow. Woo. Woo. I don't know about you. Those of you that are sitting there doing nothing, apparently you think your yesterday was fantastic. There's none righteous. No, not one. Everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. We ought to give God some thanks that he's not held us hostage because of our yesterday. Woo. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so powerful. That's so powerful. You sit down. I, I have failed God lots of times. I didn't mean to, but I did. And the last time I made a big blunder preaching at a national convention, and it was devastating, and I was so filled with repentance and remorse, and I, I just couldn't hardly hold my head up when I went to pray. I said, Lord, I don't know what happened to me, why I said what I said and how I did what I did. I, 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 I just so... I feel so bad about it. I, I've always tried to preach good for you. Here's what I heard from the Lord. Now, you don't believe the Lord talks to people. That's your business. But here the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, remember this. I will never define you by your worst moment or your weakest moment. You and I may have a bad yesterday, but we can have a fantastic tomorrow. I'm not going to let this go. I think everybody in the house ought to give God some thanks for the fact that he's not going to consult your yesterday to determine your tomorrow. Where would we be today if God started doing that in our lives? We would never get saved. We would never go to the altar. Our lives would never turn around. We could be held hostage by the mistakes that we've made. My Lord, have mercy. See? I, 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 I see, I, th I thought my sermon was going to be over now. I did. I really did. I thought once I said these two things, this church will explode with thanks. And you just Let me try it again. If you're, that's not spiritual enough for you, read Psalms 130, 3 and 4. He said, Lord, if you were to mock iniquity, who can stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you might be feared, honored, served, or revered. If God would have tally up my yesterdays and your yesterdays, we couldn't hold our head up. We would be ashamed to come into a church and try to live for God. But God, who is rich in mercy, God, who is full of glory and grace, God turns around and looks at you irregardless of your mistaken behavior. You have so much value. You're too valuable to be lost. I, just sit down. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to go. I, I just want to get everybody, everybody involved with this. Do you understand that, that David's son raped that girl, Tamar, and had her live with that shame and that guilt of what had happened? And then Absalom turns around and kills Abner, Amnon, and then runs away because he's guilty. Now, you're the theologian among us, Doc, but I can't find any sacrifice offered for murder. Not one. The sacrifice is everything. I have not, you may know it, but I haven't found it, that there was a sacrifice for murder. Mm -mm. So he murdered that guy. Now, watch this. Here's what got me. But the king's heart was towards him. And David longed to go to his son. The only reason he couldn't go was because it would be politically incorrect. He was the king and a daddy, and there was conflict. I wonder if I have any daddies in the house that sometimes our sons and our daughters have done some dumb things and is a conflict. No, you're not getting it yet. Boy, you're too quiet for me. I'm fixing to flip out on you here. 
I am. This, I, thought, I thought you, even you old fat people, I thought you'd be running. Some of you jelly bellies go to give more bounce to the ounce. Just shake, rattle, and roll, man. You know, just, you put all that tonnage on, move it around once in a while. Don't sit there and make a condo. See, you're, you're acting like, I don't know what Brother Arnold's talking about. I have no bed yesterday. I do. I was a hell raiser. I was a honky tonker. I was a whoremonger. I packed a gun. I robbed places. I've been in jail. I've been a bad boy. I'm not bragging. I've just been a bad boy. But when God got ready to deal with me, he didn't consult my yesterday. He didn't say, I can't use you. Baby, he can use anybody. He can deliver anybody. He can turn anybody around because he's greater than disgrace. Woo! You, you said, now please, I, 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 don't, I don't mean to be offensive, but I do mean to be almost abrasive. You ready? He comes in and there's a man with a withered hand. Now, the Jews, who are very religious, and if you're Jewish here, don't get ticked off, but you're in the book. <laughs> and they watch to see if he will heal. Not that he couldn't heal, but whether he's going to violate their concept. Let me tell you something. Concepts can become chains. Precepts can become prisons that hold you hostage. And, I, and I'm part of the United Pentecostal Church. I don't plan to go anywhere, but I will not let the UPC standard and the manual hold me hostage from doing right. Even if I have to violate some of their tenets to win people and touch people and help people. Uh, uh, Sometimes you got to end up looking bad to do good. Is, is there any, is the human race here this morning? Are you hearing me? They're standing back saying, if he heals that guy, we're going to damn him and condemn him and rip him apart. Not because they didn't want the guy healed. They didn't want their tradition violated. Our concept of the Sabbath is you can't do any work, you can't do anything, and he turns around, watch. He made an appeal, if you're Jewish, don't get offended, but he made an appeal to the highest mindset that they had. They placed a great value on money, profit, and materialism. And he said, well, I can't appeal to their compassion. They ain't got any. I can't appeal to their mercy because they're dummies. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll appeal to the thing that means the most to them. Profit. Money. And he said, uh, which one of you having a sheep? As soon as they said sheep, the dollar signs went. Chick -chick 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 -chick. And he fall in the pit. Would you not lay hold on him in the pit? Although it's the Sabbath. Yeah, 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 yeah. And every one of those Jewish people said, that's different. Because to us, profit is more important than people. But God's got an attitude. People are more important than profit. You're more valuable than the galaxies. You're more important than the planets. You've got more worth than anything in this whole world. Do, 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 do you uh, sit down? Uh, thank you. I'm going for the super glued people. Do you understand what I'm telling you right now? Have you considered how long the trip was from glory to planet Earth? Have you considered the price that was paid to forgive us and save us? Doesn't that journey in the incarnation shout to you? That's what the incarnation is saying. You're too valuable to be lost. You've got too much worth to be lost. I, I don't know how far it is from, from God's glory world to the planet. I know it's millions of light years, but I don't know how far it is. And he made the trip for stupid people. Hell raising fools. Dummies, morons, idiots. He said, man, I'll move heaven and hell to save Jeffrey. 
I'll move heaven. I will not let you go to hell without overriding Calvary's cross and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You're going to have to work at going to, Cal going to hell because I'm working getting you to heaven. Don't you get it? He's on your side. He thinks you're valuable. He thinks you're worth his dying. Woo. Got an attitude. Said, and the king longed to go to his son, but he couldn't afford because it was politically incorrect. He had to be a king and a dad. And the kingship won out. I don't know about you. I'm so glad that he is holy, he is righteous, no evil, ungodliness, and wickedness is going to the city. And I complied with all those stupid titles, but the Lord said, yeah, but I can make you to become. I can change your life. I can, listen, I'll tell you what, if you repent and get baptized in Jesus' name, your whole past will be washed away. And when you come to talk to me about what you did, I'm going to say, I don't know what you're talking about. You don't have any yesterday. You don't have any dirty past. You don't have any failures. I've given you a brand new slate. I'm taking a divine eraser, and I'm erasing all your... If you've had your past forgiven, I want you to stand up and clap your hands and shout and say, thank you, Jesus for not consulting my past to determine my future. Woo! Woo! Wow! Wow! I said it once, I'm gonna say it again. If you would mock iniquity, who could stand? The answer is nobody. But you're not consulting my past to determine my future. You've got so much power. You can forgive my past in five seconds. You can cleanse my yesterdays in five seconds. So I'm not held hostage nor condemned by my mistakes. If, if you finish giving God enough thanks for having no yesterday, you can sit down. Every lying devil wants to point to you and I and tell us about our yesterday. You ain't got a yesterday. If you repented, you ain't got a yesterday. If you've been baptized in his name, you ain't got a yesterday. He only points to you because he's got a yesterday. Before you're seated, turn around and shout at eight or nine people and say, God's got an attitude about me. Now shout again and say, so you better get your mouth off me and get your looks off me and shut your trap because God's got an attitude about me. I know you don't think I'm worth it, but he thinks I'm worth it. You don't think I've got value. He thinks I've got value. Woo. You, you didn't sit down? I, I, please forgive me, Rev. I, I thought... I was so intoxicated with writing this stuff out. I thought, my God, I won't get one third of this done. These holy rollers in Canaan, they'll go ballistic. <laughs> I, I don't have any past. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> I don't have anything to be embarrassed about. I do. Right. Right. And I'm glad about that. I don't have any skeletons in the closet because God bought the closet. Don't be held hostage because people's got an opinion or an attitude about mistakes you made. You take your mistakes to the throne, it's over. You take your yesterday to the throne and now all you got is a tomorrow. Let me, let me try it again. What should we do with the fifth child? Being at one head blindness and one had deafness and one died at birth and one had this disease and those stupid imbeciles, higher education to learn how to live lower, turned around and said, oh, you ought to bought that baby because of the record. Aren't you glad that God didn't abort us? Aren't you glad that you weren't a stillborn? Aren't, uh, aren't you glad God didn't write you off, but he wrote you in? 
He wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life. I know I'm not worthy to be in there, but he accounted me worthy. I have no right to be a preacher, but he's made me a preacher. I am... I have no right to be a saint of God, but he's given me the right to be a saint of God because he will not check with my past to determine my future. Now, those of you right now in this service that you're not where you could be with God or maybe you've wandered away, or you've got a little colder and different, my God, this ought to be like a candy stick in your mouth right now. That God has turned around and said, I won't consult your cursing and your swearing and your immorality and your cheating and your lying and your IRS tax. Oh, you don't pay taxes up here. Okay, IRS taxes where I live. I said, I won't consult any of that. I won't consult any time that you've had a bad attitude. I won't check on you yesterday for me to deal with you for today. That ain't going to happen. And I'm not going to let any... <laughs> Look, Matt, when he checked with them and said... What about the lamb? What about the sheep? Is not, a, is not a man more precious, more worthy, more valuable than a dumb sheep that goes into a pit? Do you not lay hands on it, that sheep? Though it's the Sabbath? It's almost like the Lord said, Reverend, it's like the Lord said, if an institution can be set aside to show love, compassion, and mercy on a critter, what can be done to save a man? What could be done to save a woman? What could be done to put a marriage and a family back together? Therefore, I say it's good and right that you can do good on the Sabbath because you are more valuable than tradition. You are more valuable than the Sabbath. Now, is, is, is this normal Sunday? Is this what this is? Is this the... The morning refrigerator class, is that how that works? Sunday, yeah. <laughs> so we go over to Luke 13, and there's a woman who comes walking into the, the synagogue, and she's bent over. And she can no wise lift herself up. And they sit, the Bible said, they sit there watch to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Now, they couldn't heal. They didn't fix nobody. They couldn't do nothing. They just had to protect their traditions. And Jesus turns around and he says, woman, come here. And the and poor little old bent woman comes over and he lays hands on her. He says, woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. Pow! She straightened straight up. And the minute she straightened up, all the Jewish traditionals went crazy. And the leader of the synagogue damned and condemned Jesus for healing that lady, not for the healing, but you violated our concept of the Sabbath. You can't do stuff on the Sabbath. He said six days are made for men to work. And the seventh day they're not supposed to work. So they thought that healing was a work. And he turned around. I love the, boy, you're trying to build a church here in Canada? Don't do like Jesus. Jesus is trying to win friends and influence people. Watch what he does. Hey, you hypocrite. Yeah, yeah, right. If I call anybody a hypocrite, you get mad. Jesus looked at the leader of the synagogue. He's got more degrees than a thermometer. He knows more Bible than there's Bible. He's got all his traditions and all his eggs in the line. He turns around and he says, you hypocrite. Which one of you, when you're oxen, or your cattle needs to go to watering on the Sabbath, you won't water them. And the Jewish mind says, that's money. That's profit. That's material. That's important. He said, shall not this girl, this lady, who's a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, lo, these 18 years, should she not be loosed on the Sabbath? And if you read the next verse, everybody in the Sabbath did what you don't do. Glory. And they began to worship God and give God thanks for what it does. Yes, yes. I'm going to make you do it. I don't care. You can stare a hole in my pot. I'm going to make you. If God has ever taken care of your past, tell him about it. Yes. If God has ever forgiven your yesterday, tell him about it. 
There ought to be an uproar and a praise come out of this building right now, such as this building has never heard. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, when he snatched me out of darkness and put me into the kingdom of light, I got to give God some praise. yesterday I just got a tomorrow I don't have my sins they're forgiven I don't have a disgraceful failure ridden past God has never even consulted with that Woo. oh hallelujah oh hallelujah oh hallelujah please be seated do you understand that your behavior even if it's vile or it's wicked cannot change God's opinion about how valuable you are. Now, you may have to suffer consequences for acting stupid, but he did not stop loving you. I, I'm, I guess I'm being too spiritual for you folks right now. I'll go on your level. I'll go pure carnality. Ready? Any parents in the house? This means yes. This means no. Ready? Is this Yes. Okay, put your hands down. Do you have any parents in the house that your children have failed or disappointed you? Put your hands down. Now, don't tell me you're dumb enough to have forgiven them. I don't know of one parent in this house when your child does something stupid, whether it's drugs, whether it's immorality, whether it's cursing, whether it's porno, whatever it is, that you decide to put your child up for adoption because of their mistakes. I got news for you. Even after you get born again and you do something stupid, God does not put you up for adoption and let you be turned over to the devil and lose your soul. Faithful is he who has called us who will also do it. He is the keeper of my soul. Woo. Woo. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pre Am I? Wait, I'm not going to ask him. I'm going to ask you. Am I preaching good yet? I wish your level of good response would meet the level of my good preaching. Let me tell you something. I told you last night about never getting out of church. Here's one of the great reasons I can't afford to get out of church. I can't afford for him to resurrect my past. I don't want him to bring up what went under the blood. I don't want him to rub that in my face. No, 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 no. I'm not going to let any devil intimidate me. I'm not going to let any person's opinion hold me hostage. I remember when you did that. I remember when you had that baby out of wedlock. I remember when you got put in jail. Big deal. God says, I don't remember none of that. That ought to put a praise on your lips. That ought to put a hand clapping in your hand. That ought to put a dancing in your feet. The think that he's not checking my yesterday to determine my tomorrow. Right. Woo! Woo! Hey, please, 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 please be seated. I'm going as fast as I can, Rev. I'm going as fast as I can. This is, this is so powerful to me that God... <laughs> see, God was incarnated in the man Jesus. And, and what he did is he touched a nerve in the Jewish heart, which was right next to his pocketbook. Okay? He said, oh, I can't get you with compassion and mercy. I'll deal with you on your profit. You do something for a lamb you wouldn't do for a man. Why? Because you can get money out of the lamb. That's... I'm going, to, I'm going to do like you. I'm going to see how you like it. <laughs> Could I help you with this? This doing this means nothing. We can't hear the nuts and bolts rattling in your head. When you turn around and go. They got little dumb dolls that do that. My, my grandson's got when you shake him, he goes. I say, you remind me of some people I preach to.
I'm going to try it again. I'm, I'm going to come right down in your face. I'm going to help you with it. Do you understand what I just said? You don't have a past. Hell can't bring up your past sins because they've been forgiven. Don't let your relatives and your neighbors, don't let your own emotions keep reminding you, well, I did this and I did that. That may be true, but you've been forgiven. You've been shown mercy. You've been given grace. You don't have a past. All you have is a present. Woo. Oh, hallelujah. Please, please, please be seated for just a second. You, you get what I'm telling you? Now watch. Jesus turns around and and in, in Luke 15, 1 and 2. Now, we all know the so-called parable of the prodigal son. I don't mean to be uh, rude, Reverend. You can straighten it out later because you're the baptized brain, okay? But I'm telling you what. The story is not about the prodigal son at all. It's not about the prodigal son. And uh, probably the reason you called the prodigal because some nincompoop put a title somewhere in there and he called it the prodigal son. No, no. I don't even think half of you know what the word prodigal means. If you look it up in the dictionary, you got, you got dictionaries in Canada, don't you? It has words in it and you read words. Okay. If you look up prodigal in, in your, one of your Canadian dictionaries, here's what prodigal means. Extravagant, lavish, overwhelming, without limit, expenditure. The prodigal in the story is not the boy. The prodigal in the story is the dad. Oh, we make a big deal about the boy wasted his inheritance and he wasted his stuff. Wait a minute. He didn't waste nothing compared to what the old man did. Right, right, right. When that boy come walking down the road, yes. the old man went blitzkrieg. The old man said, it, it's my boy. Yeah. And he runs down there and before he's bathed, before he stinks better, before he's had a shave, before he doesn't smell like a whorehouse or a honky tonk, he turns around and grabs the boy and hugs him and kisses him. Don't you get it? The prodigal father is a revelation of our father. That's how he feels about us. That's how he sees us. He's so happy when we come back. He's so thrilled when we come home. Please be seated. Please be seated. I'm, I'm going as fast as I can. I just, you understand that? If you read Luke 15, 1 and 2, you read it. You, you do read? You do read? Okay. You, 15, 1 and 2. The Bible said, Then gathered unto him the publicans and the sinners for to hear him. Read it. That's Luke 15, 1. Watch what 15 and 2 says. And the scribes and the Pharisees damned him, complained about him because of the people that he was fellowshipping with and he was eating with. Read it, 15, 1 and 2. When you read 15 and 3, I've never heard anybody in the Pentecostal movement ever preach 15 and 3. They probably have, but I've never heard it. Here's what it says. Then spake he this parable unto them. Who is the them? It's not us. It's the critics. It's the idiots. It's the jerks. It's the cynics. They're damning and condemning him because he's dealing with publicans and sinners. And they said, then spake he this parable unto them. Why? Because he knew that their concept and their traditions were incorrect. When you have the wrong concept, you have the wrong conclusion. That's the way it works. And he says, I got to help you see how God sees these people. You see them as trash and junk. You hope they're damned and go to a devil's hell. You can care less about it because they don't meet your criteria for acceptability. Then spake he this parable unto them. The parable is written singular possessive. It's not three parables. It's one parable with three aspects. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost boy. They're all the same parable. And God is trying to get their attention and say, which of you, if you lose a sheep, you'll not leave the 99 and go out in the wilderness and find that one sheep. And when you find him, you put him on your shoulders and you come home. Watch what he says. And he goes to his neighbor and says, come rejoice with me. I have found the sheep that I had lost. When the woman swept the, the dirty floor trying to find that coin, when she finds the coin, she goes to her neighbors. Rejoice with me. I found the coin that I had lost. 
When the boy comes back, now the father didn't go looking for the boy because the boy was the only one that had a human will that could choose to leave. And if you choose to leave, you got to choose to come back. He waited for, he never stopped loving the boy. Right, right, right. I got a girl right now that's walked away from the church. I'd like to punch her lights out, but that's what she's doing. But I pray every day for her, and I plead the blood every day for her. And I'm going to be thrilled when she walks back in and prays back through to the Holy Ghost. But I didn't stop loving her, and I'm not turning her over to the devil, and I'm not asking God to kill her. She's got too much value. Jesus died for her. The blood was shed for her. And her behavior has not diminished my love and care for my child. Sit, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to hear this. I had this stroke about three years ago, and I went 90% blind, as I told you before. 90% blind. Couldn't preach no more. Six months, I couldn't drive a car. I couldn't, I couldn't read my Bible. I, I was just 90% blind. I was so devastated by that. And I'm an upbeat guy. I don't get depressed. I, I just don't get depressed. I don't go like Pentecostals. I don't do any of that crap. I'm not doing any of that junk. That ain't going to happen with me. But I just got so overwhelmed by the fact that I couldn't read my Bible. I couldn't preach. I didn't know whether I had lost the church, whether I had to resign it. I didn't know what to do. The doctors couldn't fix me. I damaged all these neurons in the back part of my brain and said, you're just dead meat. And I was sitting at my at my little desk at my house, and I got so overwhelmed, I started, I became almost hysterical in crying. I took my glasses off, and I started sobbing, and I sobbed, and I sobbed, and the tears were running down my face, off my chin. My eyes were swollen shut. I was just in the office by myself, sobbing, sobbing. How am I going to take care of Patty? Well, how am I going to pay the bills? What am I going to do? I can't preach. I can't teach. I can't write any more books. I, I can't even drive a car. I don't, they say that I'm never going to get any better. I don't know what to do. God in heaven, why have you let this happen to me? What's going on? And I sobbed and sobbed. And my little daughter, backslidden daughter, walked into the office and said, Dad, Dad, are you okay? What's the matter? I said, I'm just devastated that I've had this stroke and I don't know what to do and I don't know how to do it and she went and told her mother the next day now my mother where's where's sister uh, uh, Woodward where's sister Wood? she's you're just like Patty Arnold you are you just you, you're both librarians that's what you are you're both Pentecostal librarians and my wife is extremely low-keyed but godly just low key. I'm boisterous. I'm I'm ballistic. Man, I'm rocking and rolling. I dance in I dance in a Publix. <laughs> My wife can be shopping somewhere trying to get toilet tissue or toothpaste, and I'll just get to thinking about God. I go, hey, look out now. Whoa. I'm walking down to Publix the other day, and I'm just saying, Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And this lady passed me by. She said, Did you say something? I said, I wasn't talking to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. When I went off the platform after I resigned, I went and sat in the audience with my wife. Well, I sat right next to her. That's like, like the refrigerator section. Nothing happens there. You know, just, and every time the preacher's preaching, I'm going, I like that. That's good. All right. And they say something else. Somebody says, I'm on my feet. I'm just, yeah, let's go. And my wife turns to me and says, would you be quiet? You are embarrassing the fire out of me. This is the quiet section. I said, this ain't the quiet section. This is the refrigerator section. If you stay here long enough, you're going to die of frostbite. You, you people need to get out of here. And I'm, I went back on the platform just to save my soul. That's what I did. <laughs> now, I know some of you have your own seats, and that's where you, and the reason you sit there is because nothing happens. <laughs> you want to have a child. Next time you come to church, go sit next to some new converts. They'll give you a heart attack. <laughs> They'll jump up and say, man, I was a whoremonger and now I'm saved. I was selling drugs and now I'm live. So my life was messed up. I've been through four marriages, 16 kids, and God snatched me out. Some of you people need to start praising God for being snatched out. You didn't just come to the church. Nobody can come except God draws them. God snatches people out of darkness. Woo. Now, I've said all that to say this. Sit down, sit down, sit down. I said all that to say this. After me snotting and slobbering and crying and bawling and feeling sorry for myself, 
fun. Now, my wife, she doesn't quote scripture. She doesn't write choruses. She doesn't have visions and dreams. She just pastors Jeffrey. <laughs> and I walk out, sister, sister, I walk out into my office the next morning. She has a little note sitting on my desk. She never tells me how to pastor. She tells me when I do lousy. She never tells me when I do good. You know, so I just have to have me and Jesus take care of that. And on the desk, she has this written, change my life. Jeffrey, I know this past year has been tough. And we've had experiences that we wish had not had happened. But please listen to me. Maybe that's why the windshield in your car is bigger and brighter than your mirror. Because where you're going is greater than where you've been. Yeah. I'm sorry for what happened in you yesterday, but your tomorrow has got more promise in it than your mistakes of yesterday. And the devil is a liar. He can't be forgiven. You can be forgiven. He can't go to glory. You can go to glory. He can't have the victory. You can have the victory. Windshield. Where I'm going is greater than where I've been. Oh, oh, yeah. Are you hearing me? And, and, the, and the prodigal, we call the prodigal, comes home. And the prodigal dad starts, come on, here you go. Get the best robe. Here, kill the fatted calf. Here, put slippers on his feet. Here, here's a ring on your finger. Watch what he says. Sit down, sit down, sit down. He says, watch what he says. Now, I'm paraphrasing. Let's boogaloo, baby. Yeah. You folks remember the mashed potatoes? No, you don't remember that. I used to do that. Can you do the boogaloo? I'm ready. See, some of you people, if you would just do this, hell would have a heart attack. If some of you just one time before you left this world would go, thank you, Jesus. Everything around you would go. You say, oh, Brother Arnold, it's not in the emotion. It ain't in the sitting and staring either. Been so good to me been so good to you has not dealt with us according to our sins has not rewarded us according to iniquity but as a father pitieth his children so the Lord pitieth them that fear him can I have a few more minutes a few more minutes I know it's Sunday I know your, your belly's all cry. I don't know why some of your bellies are crying you got enough to hold off the foreign legion had I got to go eat I got to go eat you, you got to hear me. He said, your windshield is bigger and brighter than your mirror because where you're going is better than where you've been. And when I got that thing, it was like my whole attitude changed. Everything was fine. I said, okay. So those of you that are not happy that God has taken care of you yesterday, that you're not thrilled that God lets you come, I know I have no right to be a Christian. I have no right to be a pastor, a bishop, a traveling evangelist. I had no right. I, my whole previous life, this life disqualified me from ever being a part of the kingdom. But God, who is greater than my disgrace, who is more wonderful than my mistakes. Don't you get it? You got to let grace overcome your disgrace. You just got to do it. I'm not saying you don't have consequences when you make mistakes, but you got to understand... They're, 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 they're having a party. He said, watch this guy. He must not have been all Jewish. He must have been part Gentile because he said, give everybody a half a day off. He said, bring all the workers in from the field. Shut her down. We're fixing to have a party. See, to me, church is party. To you, it's just, to me, it's party. And I'm going to a party. I'm going to see him in his glory. I'm going to walk the streets. I'm going to have a new body. I'm going to have the crown of life. I ain't never going to get sick again. I'll never have a stroke again. I'm never going to die again. I'm never going to be tempted and make mistakes. I'm going to the city where the lamb is the lot. And I'm telling you, baby, that's a party. The reason why I provoke people to worship and praise God, this is the vestibule for eternity. You need to start practicing so you get with the team. Amen. I heard.
heard him say, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful and bless his name. Why? Because he's been so good to you. Because he's been so kind to you. Because he's not checking your past to determine your tomorrow. Can I have about five or eight more minutes? I know it's Sunday morning and, and we enjoy playing the living dead. I understand that. You got to hear me. You ready? This is what's scary. Now, when I made my big blunder at our conference and I went home and I was so ashamed of myself and poured my heart out to God and couldn't figure out why I said what I said and how I did what I did, I was just, I was so blown away by it. And the Lord just dealt with me and said, I know, but I will not define you by your worst moment. He said, I will let your people do that, for they specialize in that. If I ever heard the voice of God, and I'll greet this statement when I go to glory, I heard it that day. He said, son, beware, be careful. Your movement is full of preachers and leaders that are full of the elder brother spirit. Boy, it made my hair stand up. Because you see, this party's going on. And they're dancing and they're having, and the dad is just so happy. And the only nincompoop that doesn't go to the party is the elder brother. Yes, sir. Because he thinks it's great to just stay on the back porch and protest. And the dad loves the boy even though he's a jerk. And comes out and says, what are you doing out here, stupid? The party's inside. You can have onion dip and you can have diet seven up. Well, what are you doing, man? We got guacamole. You know, what are you doing? And he goes, hmm. Said, I've been living for you all these years. Never transgressed your commandment. What a liar. Never transgressed your commandment. He said, and this thy son. Notice he never called him this my brother. Because you're only my brother when you do what I think is right. He said, this thy son, who has wasted his inheritance with harlots. How did he know that? Did he go to the whorehouse? How did he know that? He said, wasted with harlots and drinking and wine, women, and song. And now he's come back. And what do you do? You kill a fatted calf. And you give everybody a day off and you throw a party for that nincompoop. What's the matter with you? He said, it's meat that we should rejoice. This, my son, was dead. Yeah. And is now alive. This my boy was, was lost. Yes. And he's now found. And the jerk still wouldn't go in. Right, right. Beware you sweet Pentecostals. Do not pride yourself on finding fault when people have done stupid things. We all do stupid things. We all do dumb things. But this is a house of grace. This is a house of refuge. This is a house of forgiveness. This is a house of mercy. We can start over. I'm not making little bad things, but I'm trying to tell you that you can't hold people hostage and say, I know when you used to do that. Sit, sit, sit down here. Sit down. I'm almost done. Now, you got to get me. I'm, I, I, I'm not doing good. This is a great sermon. I haven't preached it yet because I'm out here in the cheap seats and I can't get to my notes. But you got to get this. My daughter, my daughter, Dina Leanne, when she was a little girl. Now, my daughter, you can call the house and find out. I used to call my daughter the Michelin Tire Baby. Do you have Michelin Tires up here? No? Okay. If you look at the, 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 the posters, Michelin Tires has that guy who's a figure made out of tires, which is every little bit you got these tires. My daughter was a little fatty. She was fat enough to be two people. And coming down her legs, she had all these little fat ripples. And down her arms. She was just, I used to call it a Michelin tire baby. That's what she was. because Her favorite word was food. Now watch, she gets to be about five or six years old. My nephews come down from New York and they want to go to Disney World. And they come to Uncle Jeff. And they say, Uncle Jeff, we want to go down on Main Street. Has anybody here been to Disney? No, you don't, you're against Disney World. Okay. Disney World is a place where Mickey Mouse lives and Donald Duck and Pluto and Captain Hook and Pinocchio. They all live there. You need to go see them. They're really nice people. Let them go. Let them go. Let them go. So... so 
you know, it's funny. We live on I-75, which is two hours from Mickey Mouse. And many times on a Sunday night, we'll have wonderful visiting Pentecostal families coming down to Florida. And you talk about funny. I'll announce the visitors that are here. and so glad you're here and here from Ohio, Pennsylvania. And I'll say, are you on your way to see Mickey? And you should see the hypocrisy. <laughs> Who? <laughs> I said, you're on the way to see Captain Hook? You're going to Disney World? And they don't know, they don't know whether to spit or go blind. They don't know what to do. And they finally go, uh, yeah. I said, we're not against it. It's okay. You can go. We're not against it. It's okay. Well, my nephews and nieces are with me. And, and we're on Main Street. Now, Main Street, when I was there, had about 25,000 people down Main Street. It was about 12 broad. I mean, it was just bumper to bumper. And they said, we want to go down to the Penny Arcade, Uncle Jeff, and, and play. So I'm giving the kids money. Here's money. Here, here's money. I give my daughter all these pennies, dimes, and nickels. And I tell my niece, now look, stupid, you make sure that you don't lose her. If you lose her, I will be forced to kill you. And then, and then I will repent of it later, but you'll be dead. So I said, you make sure you, you take care of my little girl. Don't lose her. Oh, Uncle Jeff, we'll make sure. Well, they go. Well, Mom and I are kind of tired. You know, we're on Geritol. We're getting worn out. So we just sit on the bench. About an hour and 10 minutes later, here comes my two nephews and my niece running back. And they got these little teddy bears they want and things, you know, and they're laughing. And I go, where's Dina? Now, the worst thing any parent could ever hear is, didn't she come back? And I went, what? I told you not to let go of her. Yeah. Well, we got busy playing the bowling and playing games, and, and I guess she just wandered away. Now, my daughter is terrified. She's like five or six years old, lost in 25,000 people. Her daddy is gone out of his mind. Because I know about kidnappers. I know about child molesters. I know about wicked and evil people. My daughter just knows she's lost. Now, I got to try to find her. 25,000 people. Please forgive me for being so rude that day. I was not acting Pentecostal. If anybody bumped into me, my name's Raymond Woodward. That's what my name is. <laughs> And I start running down the runway. Thousands of people. And I'm, I'm saying this. Get out of the way, fatso. Get out of the way, stupid. I'll knock your brains out. Look out. And I'm running down there trying to find my daughter. She's lost in 25,000 people. I get down to the Penny Arcade. I'm frantic. I'm already crying. I'm looking. I get down. And my daughter's got fire engine red hair like her. Like, Sister Arnold, she's got fire engine red hair. So I look down and I'm screaming. I'm jumping over to people. Dina! Dina! I'm jumping up and down. Dina! Come on, Dina! And way down on the end of the road from the okay, I see this little fat butterball with the fire engine red hair. Daddy! Man, I bust, I could have run the 440 in six seconds. I run down there, I'm busting through all these dumb people. Get out of the way, fool. Get out of the way, you idiot. Get out of the way. And I get down to my little girl, my little red-headed girl, whose face is all black with tears from crying and snot running down her nose. And I grab a hold of my daughter, okay? I grabbed her so tight, I almost cracked ribs. I mean, I picked her up and hugged her. My face is all wet with tears. I'm all over the side of her face. I start jumping around. I said, come here, baby. Are you okay? Yeah. Grab daddy's hands. And she grabs my hand and I threw her up. It's like throwing 150 pounds of lard on the top of your shoulders. And I put their little fat legs, just like ripple, 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 down around my, like this. And I said, hold on to your daddy. I said, grab your daddy's chin. This is the God's truth. And I said, Doc, you talk about a man that can throw down. I can, I can put some moves on you, baby. I don't need no Pentecostal protocol. I can, I can move and groove, baby. I'm, I, I, 
I grabbed that little fat tub of lard and put her on the top of my shoulder and I just started dancing. <laughs> and my, my fat little girl's on the top of my shoulders and she's going like this. <laughs> she says, Dad, I said, shut up, fat so. I said, hold it on. I danced all the way back to where my wife was. I was so ecstatic. And God dealt with me and spoke to me. And he said, yes, and when you found your daughter, right, right, right. were you dumb enough to pick up her and mention her mistake? I said, I never mentioned it. He said, tell my people, if they'll come back to me, I won't mention theirs either. Yes. I won't bring up their mistakes. I will show their failures and rub them in their face because I'm so happy that you've come home. I'm so glad that I found you. Woo. Don't you get it? Don't you understand? God's got an attitude about you. He wants you saved. He wants you delivered. He wants you reconciled. He wants you forgiven. He wants you to start over. I'm, I'm, I'm going to close. I haven't, I haven't helped you a bit. I'm so sorry. I thought, you can sit down. I thought I'd help you. I thought, God's, God's got an attitude. He said, if you were the only guy on the planet, I'll come die for you. If, if you were the only couple in the whole world, I'll come help you. And I'll touch you because you've got too much value. You're worth too much. How much better is a man than a sheep? How much more precious is a person than tradition or a Sabbath or a concept? He said, I'll move heaven and hell to get you back. And when I get you back, I will not question you like stupid church people do. I will not bring up your yesterday. I will not rub it in your face and say, yeah, I remember when you watched this. I remember when you did this. I remember when you said, he don't do it. No more than I did and I'm just a schmo. When I had that little fat butterball on the top of my shoulders, I never one time said to her, didn't I tell you not to leave your brother, your nieces and nephews, your cousins? Didn't I tell you that... I hate that when that spirit comes in a Pentecostal church and a girl's made a mistake and a guy's made a mistake and unknowingly we go, we just had some girls come to our church and I'm not putting a premium on it. Both of them are pregnant. Both of them have no husbands. They just got big bellies. Fine. Now, some of the good elder brothers. That girl used to be in our church. She walks in. She's five, six months pregnant. I make a big deal out of it. Man, so good to see you, Gloria. Glad you're here. Glad you're home. She just breaks. Hits the altar, starts talking in tongues. You think you're doing something great because you have the elder brother spirit that you won't go to the party? That you have to say, well, she got herself pregnant. Well, so what? She's not the first. She won't be the last. No, it's not right, and she's going to have consequences for the mistake that she made. But God, help us that our people that make mistakes would rather go back to a world that accepts them than come back to a church that receives them. We ought to have a giant welcome mat outside here. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lowly of heart. You shall find rest under your souls, for my yoke's easy, my burden's light. Let me, I'm closing right now. You sit down. I want to ask you a question. I gave up preaching the sermon 15 minutes ago. When you came to God, did God put you through 21 questions? Did God show pictures of what you did that was wrong? Did God turn around and say, I can't use you because you're such a dirtbag? Must be kidding. Must be kidding. God's got an attitude about you. Here's what he is. Like Uncle Sam used to say in the USA, I want you. We used to have those signs, I want you. Right now, you need to hear what I'm telling you. God wants you. Not to ruin your life, but to make your life better. To bless you to in encourage you, to strengthen you. He's not going to bring up your mistakes. Only people with the elder brother spirit brings up your mistakes. 
God's not going to do that. So I asked the Lord praying last night and this morning, how can I help this wonderful church? He said, do your best to convince them. If you can convince them, I promise I will confirm my word. Whether it's in healing, whether it's in forgiveness, whether it's in restoration, whether it's a new chance at life. So wherever you are, right, I'm, I'm going to accept the fact that your unbelievable quiet is not a sign that I'm not preaching well, but it's a sign that you are listening well and you're trying to take this to heart. If anybody in this house, you got a past that you'd like for God to take care of. You've wandered away like my daughter. And you got lost in the house like the coin. Or you've fallen into a ditch like the sheep. The word of the Lord is being sent to you right now. God has got an attitude about you. Could, could I tell you this as, as kindly as I can? I, I'm... I'm just not used to this, okay? This is just the way you, you're fine. I'm just not used to it. I'm not trying to berate anybody. I'm just not used to it. Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat, but I pray for you. You know what he just said? Simon, you're going to lie. You're going to curse. You're going to deny me. Watch this. But two worlds want you. Right now, you're sitting here Two worlds want you. Satan wants to take you to hell. Jesus wants to take you to heaven. Simon, Simon, Satan's desired you. Why? Because he's afraid of what you might become if I get to work with you. See, you're destined to become Pentecost's first preacher. He wants to shut you down before you get there. How many of you, your children, you told me 40 minutes ago, they made mistakes. You didn't throw them out of the house. You didn't put them up for adoption. You didn't put their mistakes on the internet like some jerks do on Facebook and all that foolishness. Give me a break. This, this place, this thing called the Holy Roll of Church, this, this ought to be a place of safety. This ought to be a place where anybody and everybody can start over. I, I, I'm sorry this takes so long, Doc. I'm trying to help you. I'm not trying to impress you. I was a great preacher before I got here. You ain't had nothing to me. God's blessed me everywhere I go. I got one more thing to tell you. John chapter 8. They catch this woman. This, this is the most mind-boggling thing I've ever read in the scriptures, bar none. It says, they caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Now, she's not watching a porno show, and she's not playing little games. She's having sexual relations with a guy. Now, you got to have the nose of a Pinocchio to get your nose in that tent and, and watch this lady having a sexual affair. But he says, they caught her in the very act. Now, and this is what's so cool. Please, would you just, when I say this, would you just jump up like you really believe it? Okay, would you just do it? Say, watch. And they made the biggest mistake anybody can ever make. They took the guilty to the feet of the God of grace. When you got somebody guilty, you don't want to take them to Jesus. You want to take them to the honky tonk. You want to take them to the movies. You want to take them to a bar and grill. You want to throw somebody guilty at the feet of the God of grace. Please be seated, and I'm closing. And, and they, they throw, said, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Watch this. This is so powerful. I talked to a friend of mine about this. He told this to me. He told me. He said, God's told it to him, showed it to him. He said, Lord, how did, how did those people catch her in the very act of adultery? Here's what he told me the Lord said. I sent them. Huh. I said, he said, what? He said, the Lord said, I sent them said, you sent those men to catch that woman in the act of adultery? Why? Because she was lost in herself. And there was no room in her religion and her economy for adultery. So she's doomed to be stoned to death. So I thought she had so much value. 
although she's making a mistake. I sent these religious bigots to catch her because I knew they would bring her to me. Huh. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and they throw, can you imagine? I don't mean to be crude or rated X, but you can imagine when they yanked that girl out of the tent. She's trying to cover herself. Whether she's got a Band-Aid or a part of a garment, she's humiliated, she's embarrassed, and they're dragging her down the street like a piece of meat. Where's the guy? Was he a preacher, had to go to work? Was he a priest that had to do ceremony? How'd they let the guy go? They caught them both. But they grabbed the woman. And they're dragging her down the street and that poor lady is so embarrassed and humiliated and they just throw her like a piece of meat at his feet. So we caught her in the very act of adultery. Moses said, you're supposed to stone her. What do you say? You know the story, writes in the sand. He says, I said, what do you say? He gets up and says, okay. Anybody ain't got no sin? Right. Chuck them at him. Throw the stones at her. Go ahead. I wish I could have been there. It would have been the best home video ever made. Because all they heard when he said that was thud, 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 thud. As all those guys started dropping the stones because they had skeletons in their own closet. And he finally stands up. He says, woman, where are thine accusers? Has nobody condemned you? No, sir. Well, then, neither do I. Go thy way and sin no more. Why? Because God will never consult your past to determine yes, your yes, future. Yes. We, we need to stand right now, okay? You've been a very kind audience, but, but I, I would feel very defeated if we didn't have a good altar call right now. If anybody in this building needs their past to be done away with or you've had your past done away with, that you would come and give God some praise and thanks that you have no past. Some of you, you got to get away from your mirror and start looking in that windshield. Yes, he is not against you. He is for you. I, I wish I'd have done a better job with this, but I just did the best I could. God has got an attitude about you. He wants you forgiven. He wants you helped. He wants you saved. He wants you to be free of guilt. He wants you to be free of shame. If you would, if you would, come on to the altar right now and let's pray. You don't have to kneel down. You can just stand up here just for a minute. Let's pray. Let's pray. <laughs> let's pray. Let's pray. God's got an attitude about you. He ain't going to let hell take you to a devil's hell without a fight. The blood is talking for you. The Holy Ghost is talking for you. Angels are doing battle for you right now. God's got an attitude about you. You're too valuable to be lost. You've got too much worth to just go wandering away somewhere. Maybe some of you have got some children that have wandered away. Let me tell you what, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. God is the God of restoration, the God of deliverance, the God of forgiveness. Listen to me. God would rather pardon you than punish you. God would rather forgive you than forsake you. God would rather reconcile you than reject you. That's the kind of God we got. Come on. He's on your side. If you don't have any past you need to get rid of, then give him thanks for the past that you did get rid of. Come on. Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's pray. Ooh, Jesus. Glory to God. Should we kill the child? No, no. I'm not going to kill because the next child was Beethoven. You've got music in your life that hasn't been played yet. You've got songs in your life that haven't been sung yet. You can do something. You can do something for the kingdom. Don't let no devil tell you you're not worth it. Yes, you are. That's why he's fighting you. That's why two worlds are wanting you. Because you can do something for God. Oh, give me, give me some music, Lucille. Give me some music. I'm scared half to death with all this silence. Hallelujah. There's nothing to dirty that you can't make worthy. You wash me in mercy. I am clean. Just hold on one 
second. I have never met a person. I haven't traveled as much as your wonderful bishop has, but I've got a few million miles on my carcass. I have not met one person, 46 years of preaching, that Satan would not take back. Not one person that decided to leave the church and go back in the world that hell said, I don't want you. If Satan will take anybody that comes back to him, he is not greater than God. God will take back anybody that will come to him in honesty. Now we can play. Too dirty.